If you brought your Bibles this morning, we're going to play a little bit of a Bible drill, and I'm going to make you turn back and forth to different things, but we're also going to put it on the screen for you as well. Uh, If you'd like to go to the first one, it's going to be in John chapter 15. Uh, John chapter 15. Uh, my, My sermon title this morning is The Multiplication Imperative. What do you think that means? That means uh, God said, be fruitful and multiply, so everyone should have at least four children. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Brandon's like, done. <laughs> uh, no, that's not, that's not really what I'm going to talk about here this morning. But uh, My wife and I, we stopped with two uh, because we wanted to stick with the man-to-man defense. We had no desire to go to the zone. <laughs> we, we figured once they outnumber us, that that's when trouble starts to happen, right? <laughs> no, yeah. <laughs> Okay, well, and then, yeah, one of them went and got married and ruined the whole plan. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, so, you know, that, not, that's not what I'm talking about. What is the multiplication imperative? It is the idea that the Christian faith dies in one generation if that generation does not make other disciples of Christ. That's really all it is. The idea that the Christian faith, you see, we don't, we don't have Jesus with, here, with us here today. Jesus came once, he lived, he, he lived his life, and he physically is not here with us anymore. He's with us in spirit and that sort of thing, but he's no longer leading his church in a physical form. He decided, he knew that his mission was to be to make disciples that then could make disciples that could make disciples that could make disciples that could make disciples. <laughs> Right? And that's why we're here today, right? Because someone in your life at some point sat you down and shared the gospel of Jesus Christ with you and helped you make a decision that has brought you into the, the, the faith of Jesus Christ and, and, and by extension of that faith has brought you into the church, right? Aren't you grateful for that person who was willing to share with you, right? Yeah, I, I know I am. I, I know... I know so much of my life is, 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 it would have been so different, right? If, if, if people hadn't been willing to get out of their comfort zones and, and, to, and to share with me, not just my parents, but others as well. You know, I, I, I was one of those uh, preacher's kids that kind of rebelled. Well, not kind of, I full on, I, I went hardcore. I rebelled pretty hard. And then I came back to my own faith. Right, I, I put that in quotes because it wasn't any different than my parents' faith. But I, when I when I was uh, when I was 17 years old, I thought my parents were idiots. And then by the time I was 22, it was amazing how much they had learned. All right, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> um, you know, but I, but I'm so glad for those people that came into my life and helped me and 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 shared with me. And it, and if they hadn't, then I wouldn't have my faith, right? And I, and I have shared that faith with others. Why? Because because that's what God has told us to do. There's an imperative that if we do not make more disciples, then Christianity will die, right? It'll just die with the the people who say, okay, that was cool for us, but we're not going to share it with anybody else. And when they die off, so does the faith. So there's an imperative built in to the entire revelation of scripture that we are supposed to go and make disciples, right? You, you've heard that as the, as the great commission, but, but what we do is we often think of that as the, the great commission for evangelism and we go out. Some of us, when we read it, what we read is go and make converts and then leave them on their own and let them figure it out. That's not what it says, is it? It says go and make disciples. Well, what's the difference between a convert and a disciple? A convert is somebody who gets to that, that, that moment. I call it the, the oh crap moment. You know, that, that moment where they're like, they're like, oh, I'm going to go to hell if I don't make a decision. You know, I, I need d- to do something. And, and they finally get to that moment and they say, okay, I'm going to place my faith in Jesus Christ. They become an infant in the faith. And then too many times we say, awesome, let's celebrate with you. Let's get you baptized and then have fun. Here's a Bible. Good luck. And that's not, that's not making a disciple. See, a disciple, to disciple someone means more than that. So I want us to look at this multiplication imperative more than just an, a, a, a call to evangelism, but how do we continue to make disciples? How do we continue to bring people along? And as we're being discipled, as we're being mentored, how do we continue that process with others? So let's, let's look together 
And how Jesus took this, this idea of, of making disciples and he, and, he, and he did it. He did it in a way that, we can, that modeled it for the rest of us. The, the, the disciples that he made after he left, after he, after he was crucified, resurrected, and ascended back into heaven, they used the same model and, and God grew the church exponentially from there. And, and, and the, the millions of people that have been, that have been brought into the faith have, have looked at this same model. So how do we look at it together? Okay, it was modeled by Jesus. So what is it? I want to, I want to, I want to call it the apprenticeship model. The apprenticeship model. Uh, if you're in a trade in here, uh, you know, somebody who's like a welder or something, I'm going to pick on Randy. He's just sitting up front here. Uh, uh, you had to apprentice to, to do your job, right? Somebody had to teach you. Was it just here, here's this, this thing that makes metal go hot and liquid and, and have fun? Uh, I hope not, right? <laughs> Otherwise, uh, that might be why he only has seven fingers. No, I'm kidding. He, I, I think he's got all 10 of them. Nine and a half. Okay, good. All uh, right. You know, uh, you know, somebody has to come alongside it. And what does an apprenticeship model look like? Is it just here, I'm going to show you once and then I'm going to leave you on your own? No, let's, let's look at this. There's a, there's a five-step process to this. Step number one is I do, you watch, then we talk. I do, you watch, then we talk, right? As I was teaching my son uh, different things, you know, I, that's, that's, a, that's a father's job, right? You love, to, you love to come alongside your son and teach him some of the things that you know. Um, you know, it always started with that. I would always demonstrate to him, this is what we're trying to do, right? Because sometimes you can't get your head wrapped around things until you get out there and do it, right? I remember uh, my son, uh, I was a football, co- football player. I loved football. I was a football coach for 10 years, uh, but I promised my wife I wouldn't push that onto my son and I wouldn't live vicariously through him. And so he, and he had no interest in it until finally it was his freshman year and he decided, I want to try football. And I was like, okay, cool. I mean, he's built for it. I mean, the kid's like, you know, 5'11", 230. I, mean, I was like, I was like you're, a, you're a linebacker if I ever saw one, right? And, and, I, and I got all excited and everything. And I was like, okay, I said, here's what we're going to do. And he says, okay, well, first of all, you got to teach me the game. And so the first football game we sat down and watched, he came up and sat on the bleachers with me. And I said, no, son, it's okay. You can go sit with your friends. And he goes, no, no, no. I want you to, I want you to teach me the, the game and everything. This is after he had been playing and practicing for a few weeks. And I, and I thought the coaches had kind of brought him up to speed and everything. He sits down next to me and I said, okay, well, what do you want to know? He goes, well, first of all, what's a down? <laughs> and I'm going, <laughs> okay, we're starting from scratch here, right? <laughs> What's a down? <laughs> you know, yeah, I keep hearing them talk about first down, second down, third. What does that mean? <laughs> you know, so we were starting from, and so I, I, as I was teaching him, I had to, I had to show him things. I, I, I couldn't just say, well, get down in a three-point stance. Well, what's a three-point stance? Well, if I just described it to him, he probably would have ended up looking all weird and everything, right? You know, but in, instead of me just describing it, first thing I did is I showed him, I demonstrated, I said, I'm going to do it, you're going to watch, and then let's talk about it. Let's ask, let's ask those questions. And we see Jesus modeled that with his disciples as well. This, this passage that we read right before our, our, our communion continues on. Look with me, if you would, at John chapter 15, in verse 14. So in verse 12 and 13, he said, this is my commandment that you love one another, just as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that one lay down his life for his friends. We're going to pick it up in verse 14, and it says, you are my friends if you do what I commanded you. No longer do I call you slaves, for the slave does not know what his master is doing, but I have called you friends for all the things that I have heard from my father I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you would go and bear fruit and that your fruit would remain so that whatever you ask of the Father in my name, he may give to you. Did you see that? He says, number one, I chose you. See, he invited them to be a part of things. He, invited, he says, you didn't choose me, I chose you, right? When Jesus was, was gathering his disciples, he, he met these men and he was like, you, follow me, right? He, he chose them and he said, he said, I want you to be a part of this. He included them in what he was doing. He says here that slaves do not know what the master is doing, but he says, I call you friends for all the things have been made known to you. He said, I, 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 I chose you, I, I brought you in, and I want to teach you all the things that the Father has given me. 
All the things that the Father has taught me, I want to pass on to you. And he gives a clue here as to the, how this is supposed to work. He says that you may go and that you would bear fruit and that your fruit would, re would remain. I want you to think about that for a moment. That they would go and bear fruit. What is the fruit that they would bear? Other disciples, right? That they could, they could repeat this process. That they could go and, and make disciples uh, uh, based on how Jesus helped them. They're going to go and do the same thing. And then he says, and that your fruit would remain. Now, does, that, does fruit stick around very long? No, you know, fruit is one of those things that... Um, you don't always know it's gone bad until you pop it in your mouth, right? Uh, the, I'm one of those people that I, I, like, I like the smell test. My wife is one of those people that lives and dies by the, by the, the due date or the expiration date. I'm, I'm kind of like, oh, come on. They print that on there and they're always being safe. You can always go way past that date. Right? And I was like, you start out with the smell test, right? If it smells bad, okay, it's probably bad, right? But if it smells good, then you move on to test number two, which is what, guys? The taste test, right? You grab one, you know, I think the grapes are fine. They seem to be cool. You pop one in your mouth and you're like, oh, okay, that's more Chardonnay than it is grape. <laughs> All right? It's moved on a little bit too. Fruit doesn't stick around very long. So what does he mean that your fruit would remain? Guys, what is fruit when you think about it? Fruit is the multiplication process of a, of a plant. They bear the fruit that bears the seed. The seed, the fruit gets eaten or gets, gets thrown down or whatever. And what does it do? It creates a new tree, right? So the fruit that would remain is not that, not that the people that you convert and disciple will last forever on this earth, but that they will be the agent of creating more and more and more. So we see this in Jesus' model. He says, he says I'm going to do, you're going to watch, and then we're going to talk about it. See, and then Jesus, before he moves on, he imbues them with some confidence that they would be successful. He says that you would go and bear fruit. And he says, you know, when somebody says you can do this or I believe in you, does that mean something to you? You know, it, when somebody shows confidence in you, I remember my, my, when my son and, and daughter were very young. My son was about four years old. My daughter was about six. I may have told you this story before. My son and I, we used to love this game where he would, we, he would run across the house. We had, a, we had a house that had a living room, a narrow hallway, and then like a family room just next to the kitchen. And so I would get all the way at the end of the family room. He would get all the way at the end of the living room so he could run the 30 feet across the whole house. And he would come at me full speed. I was sitting down on the ground and I would, I would catch him and I would absorb his momentum, roll down onto my back, my feet would come up and I would let him go over my head, stopping before his head hit the ground. That's the important cat factor. Uh, uh, fathers, if you're gonna try this, that's a key point, right? If you go back this way and you hear a thunk, you've done it wrong, right? <laughs> And your wife will not be happy with you, right? So, but I would absorb it, and then I'd bring him back, and he'd run him back, and he'd do it again. We would do this over and over and over. And he used to love to see how much speed he could get and how hard he could hit me and everything. While my daughter sees this, uh, we're having all this fun. She's two years older, a little bit bigger. And she says, well, I want to try it. And Logan, and she, she's like, but I'm scared. I don't know. And Logan said something to her that imbued me with, uh, number one, confidence and Fear and dread. <laughs> my my, my, my four-year-old son says to my six-year-old daughter, don't worry, dad will catch you. He won't let you fall. I guarantee it. <laughs> and at first I was like, yeah, that's right. Oh, crap. <laughs> boy, I better not fail on this one, right? I'm gonna, I'm gonna crush this little boy's spirit, right? But when someone says, I believe in you, right? That's what Jesus said. He said, you're going to bear fruit. You're going to go and do incredible things. And wasn't that a true prophetic statement? Didn't the disciples go and do incredible things? I mean, we, we see outside of the gospels, we see the rest of that story. They, they started the church. They, and our, our, we're here today because of the incredible things that they were able to do. So first step of the process, I do, you watch then we talk. Step number two, I do, you help, then we talk. I do, you help, then we talk. Mark, thir Mark chapter three, verses 13 through 16 says this. And he went up on the mountain and he summoned those whom he himself wanted and they came to him. And he appointed 12 so that they would be with him 
and that he could send them out to preach and to have authority to cast out the demons. You see, there's an important thing to notice here. Jesus, although fully capable, he never intended to do his ministry alone, right? Although he could have if he wanted to. I mean, could God have done whatever he wanted? Sure. You know, that's one of the great mysteries of, of God is why he chooses to involve us at all because all we do is screw it up, right? All we do is make it harder. Have you ever had that, have you ever had that job where you thought, you know what, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to lead these other people to do it, but if they would just get out, of my, get out of my way, I could do it so much faster, right? I'm sure God feels that all the time as we're out here bumbling and stumbling. He's just going, oh, bless your heart, <laughs> Right? Could he, was Jesus fully capable of doing everything that he wanted done? Yes. But he never, he, he, it was never his intent, it was never his intention to do it alone. He said, so, he said I'm bringing you together. I'm, he appointed the 12 so that you would be with me. Jesus appointed co-laborers so that they would be with him, so that they would learn from him, that they would do it with him. See, Jesus was building a system that could carry on without him. He knew he was, he was not long for this world. He knew that his, his, the, the part of his mission that, that, in, that required him to be physically on earth was a very short amount of time, but he also knew that the, the mission had to continue beyond him. So he brought, he, he appointed co-laborers. He said, I want you to come and do this with me. I want you to help me complete this mission. Even though I could do it on my own, I'm choosing to involve you. I'm choosing to bring you along. So step number two in the apprentice process is I do, you help, and then we talk about it. Step number three is this. You do, I help, and we talk. Right? It went from I do and you help me to, okay, you're going to take the primary, you're going to take, the, you're going to take the lead on this, and I'm going to be there to help you, and then we're going to talk about it. We see Jesus model this for us as well. Matthew chapter 14. This is a, this is a very common story. You guys ever heard of the, the feeding of the 5,000? Little boy with a small lunch, the five loaves and two fish and everything. There's something that often gets missed in here, and I want us to, I want us to key in on that. Matthew chapter 14, verse 16 says this. But Jesus said to them, they do not need to go away. You give them something to eat. Did you catch that? Sometimes we forget that. Sometimes we think, oh, the disciples came to him and said, hey, Jesus, we got this huge crowd of people. They're getting hungry. What are we going to do? And it's Jesus, we skip over in our mind to the part where Jesus says, well, here, give me the little boy's lunch and I'm going to do something miraculous. We skip over the part where he looks at them and says, how has your faith grown? Where are you at? You've seen me do miracles. You've seen me do all kinds of things. You even have a little bit of faith because you brought me the small boy's lunch. So at least you, you, th you think that something can be done, but I want to see where your faith is at. And what does he tell him? He says, you give them something to eat. What would have happened if one of them had had the faith to be like, okay, cool. Could the miracle still have happened? I believe it could have. I think Jesus was giving them an opportunity. He says, listen, I want you to do the work. Now, I'm going to help, but you, he says, he, he said, you give them something to eat. Verse 17, they said to him, we have here only five loaves and two fish. See, they were, their faith was killed by the absurdity of it. Have you ever had that happen to you? Have you ever thought, well, God can do anything, and then you see the absurdity of it, and you're like, well, but anything but that. How, how small our God is sometimes, Right? How small our faith is. You think, oh, well, God can create the universe, but he can't solve my problem. The absurdity killed it for him. They said, well, we only have here five loaves and two fish. Verse 18, and he said, bring them here to me. Ordering the people to sit down on the grass, he took the five loaves and the two fish. And looking up toward heaven, he blessed the food. And breaking the loaves, he gave them to the disciples. And the disciples gave them to the crowds, and they all ate and were satisfied. They picked up what was left over of the broken pieces, 12 full baskets. 12 full baskets. 
You see, we see here, Jesus gave them the opportunity. He said, hey, I want you to do and I'm gonna help. And then when they, when, they, when they couldn't do it or when they failed, then he said, okay, now I'm gonna come along and I'm gonna help you. And he, and he offers his help. He says, he says, okay, bring me what you've got. And then it says, it says here that he blessed it. He asked God for a special provision. And then he began to break it and he handed it to his 12 disciples. Now, the question here I always wanna know is where did the miracle take place? I want you to think about this for, for a moment. Um, just in logistical terms, right? Uh, just, just a moment ago, we had communion. We had four gentlemen with trays, with, 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 with crackers and juice in them, and the four of them served the 180, 200 of you guys, okay? Now, it took them a little time, and, and when they came back up, it was kind of comical. Each one of them came back up with one thing of juice left and a little bit of crackers. It was almost like, man, it's all, it's all gone. We, next time, we may have to have five guys with trays, right? Or we may not, we may not make it, right? But they, they, were, they distributed to you. I did not distribute to all of you right? And they individually did not distribute to all of you. They each took little sections and that kind of thing. And when they ran out, they were going to run out. I say this, the scripture says that Jesus broke the bread and gave it to the disciples. And then it says, and then they went and gave it to the, to the people. Do you think that 12 men could carry enough food for close to 8,000 people, eight to 9,000 people? It says 5,000 people. Remember, they only counted the men. They didn't count the women and children. It could have been 10,000 people, right? Do you think 12 men can carry that much food? I, I, I'll tell you this. My wife and I can't even carry enough groceries to feed the two of us and my son without these giant carts. I mean, we come with two big carts and people look at us and I'm like, yes. I, I had one guy look at me like, really? You're going you're gonna to get that much? And I, I looked at him and I said, I have a 19-year-old son. He goes, okay, I get it. Do you think these 12 men could carry enough food to satisfy 10,000 people in one trip? No. Then what do we think happened? Do we think they made thousands of trips? Here's what I believe. I believe the miracle took place in Jesus' hands first. As he broke the bread, as he divided the fish, he gave to Andrew. Broke the bread, divided the fish, he gave to Philip. Broke the bread, divided the fish, gave to John. I believe the miracle took place in his hands in order to take five loaves and two fish and divide that among 12 men. And then I believe the miracle continued to take place as Andrew went and broke some bread and gave some fish to Gare and then to Sue and then to Brian. I believe the miracle continued to take place in the hands of the disciples. You see, it wasn't just that Jesus was saying, hey, I'm going to do this incredible thing. He said, I want you to do this incredible thing. And I'm going to help. See, you do. I watch. Then we talk. Step number four. I'm sorry. I said it, I said it the wrong way. That was, I, that was you do. I help. We talk. Step number four is this. You do. I watch. Then we talk. What does that mean? That means that you. That means you're not, you're you're not doing anything for them. That means you're 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 giving them the assignment, and you're still going to watch. You're still going to be there. You're still going to give uh, evaluation and that kind of thing. But they're the ones taking on the task. Mark chapter six. Jesus models this step for us. Mark six verse seven says, and he summoned the twelve, and he began to send them out in pairs, and he gave them authority over the un unclean spirits. And he instructed them that they should take nothing for their journey except a mere staff, no bread, no bag, no money in their belt, but to wear sandals. And he added, do not put on two tunics. And he said to them, wherever you enter, wherever you enter a house, stay there until you leave town. Any place that does not receive you or listen to you as you go out from there, shake the dust off the soles of your feet for a testimony against them. So what did they do? They went out and they preached that men should repent and they were casting out many demons and were anointing with oil many sick people and healing them. What was that? That was Jesus passing on authority and he said, now you go and do what you've seen me do. Did they have authority to cast out demons or heal people before that? No. 
And yet Jesus said, okay, you've been along with me in this process. You've watched as I've done things. You've helped as I've done things. Now I want you to go and do the same things. And he, and he let them go and, and they went out and they began to do the things that they saw Jesus do. Why? Because number one, Jesus gave them authority. Jesus gave them authority. He said, the authority that I have, I'm giving to you. You see, before they had Jesus' authority, the demons weren't afraid of the disciples, <laughs> right? I need you to understand that. I, I, I full heartedly believe that demons are real and I, I guarantee you, they are not afraid of you. They are certainly not afraid of me, but they tremble at the name of Jesus Christ. They tremble at the authority of the God that they recognize. They understand who God is way better than we do. They understand they have no reason to fear us, but they are terrified of the authority of of God and his son. And he gave that authority to these disciples. He said, I'm giving you the authority to go and do the things that you saw me do. He also gave them instructions. Here's how you're gonna do it. He told them, number one, don't rely on your own earthly understanding. Don't rely on your own stuff. He said, don't take any food with you. Don't take any money with you. Don't even take a a, a spare set of clothes. For some of us, that would be very hard for us to do. I've seen how some of y'all travel. You know what I'm talking about? You know, I'm thinking, hey, I'm going to be gone for two days. I've got my backpack. It's got my computer in it. It's got one pair. It's got two pair of socks, two pair of underwear. Uh, I've got the pair of jeans I'm going to wear for the whole three days. And I got two t-shirts in there. I'm ready to go, right? And then my wife comes upstairs and she's got, uh, she looks like, uh, have you guys ever seen Joe versus the volcano? The, the big trunks and everything, that's the way my wife travels, right? <laughs> she's, like, she's like, well, I just don't know. I said, honey, it's only two days. Well, I don't know how I'm going to feel tomorrow. I don't know if I'm going to wear this or this or this. And I was like, yeah, but you've got three pairs of shoes here that are exactly the same. No, they're different colors. Well, two of them are white. One of them is off-white. Okay, I stand corrected. <laughs> All right. Can you imagine being sent out the way Jesus said, don't take any food with you, don't take any provisions with you, don't don't even take any money with you. I want you to be reliant on me the whole time you're out there and I will provide what you need. He said, I want you to go and do and I'm gonna watch. He gave them authority, he gave them instructions, he also gave them a warning. He also gave them a warning. He says, any place that does not receive you or listen to you as you go out from there, shake the dust off the soles of your feet for a testimony against them. What do you think Jesus was telling them to do here? Do you think he was telling them to to curse them and be like, oh, well, you rejected me, therefore fire from heaven. That's what John and James probably would have done, right? Because <laughs> that's what they wanted to do, the sons of thunder, right? They were like, they were like we should, can we call down thunder from heaven? He's like, no, no, that's not what he was saying. What was he saying? He was saying, shake the dust off. In other words, what was he, what was he saying? He was saying, don't let, it get, get, don't let it get you down. I was a door-to-door salesman when I was a younger man. Um, I, I went around and I, I sold uh, AT&T long distance to businesses. Do you guys remember when, it, when long distance was a thing? <laughs> <laughs> when MCI and AT&T would fight over your business. Well, I would go door-to-door to businesses and sell AT&T, or I would go door-to-door to uh, residential, to homes, and sell them DirecTV, you know, because DirecTV is so much better than, ca- than cable. That was part of my spiel, right? And what I had to learn very early on is I couldn't let the nose bother me. I needed, in order for me to make a living, I needed to, I needed to make about 100 bucks a day. This was, uh, this was 30 years ago, so add, add a few zeros if you need to, if you, to make it today. But uh, I needed to make about 100, 100 bucks a day, and I could make a living off of that. I knew that in order for me to make $100 a day, I needed to sell three satellite dishes in a day. I also knew that in order to sell three satellite dishes, I had to get, I had to get through about 15 no's before I could get to the three yeses. That was my average, 15 no's for three yeses. And once I understood that the no's weren't actually a bad thing, that it was actually getting me closer to my goal, once I, once I stopped taking that personally, why, why didn't you like me? I did a good job, right? <laughs> right? Uh, once, I, once, I quit, once I quit allowing that to bother me and discourage me, and I started looking at it as this, if I get those 15 no's out of the way first thing in the morning, I can get my three yeses and go home. 
right? And so I, so I would go, and every time somebody would tell me no, or they'd slam the door in my face, instead of going, oh, I hate this job, it turned into, yes, one down. All right, yes, another no. That's, that's one more out of the way. That means my yes is coming up soon, right? And that's what Jesus was saying. He said, if somebody rejects you, shake the dust off your sandals. In other words, don't carry it with you. Move on to the next person. Move on to the next thing. And Because guys, it's not that they were rejecting me. They were rejecting T- direct TV. If, so, if you're going and sharing your faith with someone, quit taking it so personal. They're not rejecting you. They're rejecting the God that sent you. And they're, they're going to have to be accountable for that. But it's not on you. Because guess what? You couldn't save them anyway. You never had that power. So quit putting it on yourself. He says, shake the dust off. He said, you do, I watch, then we talk. The final step to this process is, okay, now that you've learned, you've been, you've been my apprentice, you've watched me do it, you've helped me do it, I've helped you do it, and I've watched you do it. Now, the process isn't over until you start it all again. Step number five is very similar to step number one, but instead of I do, you watch, now it's you do, someone else watches, and then you talk. Look what he says here in Matthew 28, 18 through 20. This is a real common one. You're going to know this one. And Jesus came up and spoke to them saying, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. See, Jesus gave them the mission to multiply. But it's not just, he didn't just stop there. You know, some people think of the, verse 19 as the great commission. It's not complete without verse 20. Verse 19 says, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Oh, that's, yeah, that's the great commission. We're supposed to go and make converts. No, your, your, your Bible may show a new verse that starts there, but it's the same sentence. Don't make the mistake of distinguishing them and separating them. The same sentence goes on to say, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, right? It's not just enough that you introduce them to Jesus. It's not just, it's not enough that they make a decision and they get baptized and you think, congratulations, welcome to the kingdom of heaven. Your job is not complete until you also apprentice them and disciple them, teaching them the things that I have commanded you. That's what making disciples really is, not just making converts. You see, in order for us to fulfill the mission that God has given us, last week you heard me talking about what I believe our mission is. I do not believe it's just to, to build the biggest church that we can here in this place. I, don't, I, I, I do want to say this. We will always make room for, for you to bring your friends. You know, so maybe some of you brought a, a friend or a guest here today. I'm glad that they're here. And if, and if we ran out of space, we'd make more, right? We would, we would do whatever we had to so that everyone is always welcome into the kingdom of God. But I don't think he's, get, he's asking us to do all of that in one location at one time, Right? Because if we fill up this building, what do we do? Are we building another building? No! <laughs> this one was so hard and we're not even done. <laughs> right? No, so how do, how do we continue? Uh, that means we go outside. That means we, we go and we help start other churches. Well, in order to do that, in order to help other churches like Mid Valley and Glenwood, or to help other churches get something going over in Meeker, get something going over in Parachute, get something going. In order for us to do that, what are we going to have to do? We're going to have to apprentice some people. We're going to have to raise some people up. Right now, this morning, several of our musicians are over at Mid Valley Church doing live worship for them. And I think that's awesome. And we're going to need more of that. We've got more, every week, somebody's going to go over there until they can raise up some musicians among themselves, until they can apprentice some of their own folks, some of our folks are going to go over there and help. But that means we've got to continue raising up people among our band. We've got to continue raising up people among our, our, our service areas. 
Our children's ministry is growing. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm looking today, I'm thinking, man, we had 600 people, or over 600 people here on Thursday night. Some of them might want to come and try this church. Tammy, I hope you're ready, <laughs> right? The children's ministry may get an influx of new folks, and that's, and that's awesome, but guess what we're going to need? We're going to need new children's workers, and how do we do that? We do that through apprenticeship. I want to, I want to give you an example of that. Um, when, we, when COVID first hit, we had to shut down like everybody else. We shut down for a brief amount of time. And what we did is we, we went to online services. So we got some cameras, we got some streaming equipment and that kind of thing. We went to online services. We only did that for about six weeks. Then we went back to, to live services, basically because if the liquor stores were essential services, so were churches. That's what I said. And that's what we did, right? Because I was like, <laughs> we're going back, right? Through that process, I was kind of the, the, the one leading the streaming process. And my son was my, was my helper. And together, we learned how to do this together. And then after a while, I started preaching more and more. Pastor Albert stepped back more and more. I had to step away. It became my son's job to do the streaming. And he did that for several years. And then he went and got, he went and recruited some people. He went and chose some people and said, hey, would you come alongside and help? And, and those people came alongside and he started showing them. He started apprenticing them. He said, this is how we do it. He showed them and then they started doing it with them. Okay, I showed you that. Now you're going to start doing this part. And then before you know it, it was, okay, now you're going to do this. Then he started being able to take Sundays off where he didn't have to be there at all because other people knew how to do it, but they would come back together and reevaluate and that sort of thing. And here this morning, my son is not in the streaming room at all. He's on the drum set instead because somebody else is in charge of streaming. What did he do? He apprenticed someone. And now there's two people that can do that job and he can move on to something else. Guys, I don't care what your job is in this church. You can teach somebody else to do it because we need more of it. So, well, we, we, I'm a, I, I work on the fellowship team. Kathy, do we need more fellowship team members? Yes. <laughs> did, you hear, did you hear the inflection in her voice? The desperation, <laughs> right? Tammy, do we need more children's workers? Logan, do we need more youth workers? Yeah. <laughs> Wayne, do we need more everything else? Yeah. Brandon, do we need more musicians and, and sound techs? Yeah. Yes. Kim, do we need more workers on Saturdays at our work days? Where's Kim? He must not be in the room because he would have been like, yes! <laughs> right? We need to be multiplying ourselves in everything that God has called us to do. Why? Because we haven't reached the valley yet. Because as you walk down the street, and you look at the, your neighbor's houses, there are people in those houses that are bound for hell. God loves them and so should you. That's why we do it. Because God loves them. And so should we. And so we need, until we, until we can say we can walk through this town and there's not a single lost person left, our mission is not complete. Are you with me? Do you understand? Who are we going to decide? It's like, you know what? If, we, if we're not willing to do what it takes to reach more people, we might as well look at our neighbor. We might as well look at our coworker and say, I'm okay if you go to hell. If you can say that, then you need to check your heart. And ask yourself, do you have Jesus in it at all? Because Jesus did not say that to anyone. He did not send anyone to hell. He said, I died for all of them. Every single one of them was worth dying for. And if we don't take the same kind of mindset towards them, then we don't have God's love in us. It's an imperative that we reach the people that God has put us here to reach. It's an imperative that we multiply. And in order to do that, we got to raise more people up. Would you bow with me for a word of prayer? Heavenly Father, as we're here this morning, Lord, I pray that you would help each one of us to see that it wasn't just enough that we gave our hearts to you. Lord, it wasn't enough that, that we found a place to serve. Lord, it may not even be enough that we've shared our faith with other people. Maybe we've led some people to Christ. Maybe we've seen some people get baptized. But Lord, it's only enough when we take this mandate that you've given us to go and make disciples, to see them saved, to see them baptized, but also to, see, to teach them the things that have been taught to us. 
Lord, I pray that you would help each one of us to see the importance of that. If we're ever going to, if we're ever going to, to reach the vision that you've given us, Lord, it's going to take many of us stepping up. It's going to take those of us who already have jobs to teach others to do those jobs because those jobs need to get done in other places as well. Those jobs are getting bigger. Those jobs are getting more difficult. We need more workers. Lord, we can see that the fields are wide unto harvest. Lord, as I, as I, as I stood there and I watched six to 800 people mill about the parking lot, as I saw families with their, their children and grandkids and, and grandparents, and, and Lord, I just saw so many lost folks, so many people that I didn't recognize, I didn't know, I, so many people that I think, man, I, just, I, I would hate for them to go to to be separated from you because somebody didn't share with them. Lord, we see the the fields that are wide unto harvest, but Lord, we also know the workers are few. So Lord, we pray to the Lord of the harvest to send more workers. Lord, to send us people that are willing, Lord, and then then give us the willingness to train them, to to come alongside them and apprentice them so that we can continue to, to reach the vision that you've given us. Lord, our hearts should be broken for those that your hearts are broken for. And if not, Lord, I pray you break our hearts right here, right now. Lord, that we would look on others with the eyes that you have, with great compassion, with great love, and with with great value. And we thank you and we praise you. In your name I pray, amen. I'm going to ask you to stand with us. We're going to sing a song of invitation. If God has spoken to your heart, maybe, he, maybe you need to deal with him right where you are. Maybe you need to come to the altar and surrender. Maybe you need to come and ask a question or seek prayer. I invite you to do that as we sing together.